That is very good. The swing works the Oracle again. And the Oracle bowled in. That is out. Great theatre, magnificent drama. First match of the season, eh, huh? First match of the season, Martin. King Willow's on his throne and all's right with the world. Gods and flannelled fools. Um, <laughs> it's from a poem about cricket. Oh, very apt. How does it go on, my old hound? That's the only line I know. <laughs> oh, well, never mind. You certainly made the point. Hello. Welcome to Gods and Flannelled Fools, episode four, Hobbs and Suchcliffe. This is the series in which I walk through a history of English Test Match cricket, focusing on key series, matches, players, and teams of particular interest at various points. So basically exploring the myths and legends of the game that collectively have really led to how we view Test Match cricket today. If you haven't already listened, I've got a pilot episode, which is a brief history of the game up to the very first two test matches in 1877. That's available, as well as the first three episodes in which I discuss firstly the birth of the Ashes in 1882, uh, the great Ashes series of 1902 with uh, Jessup's famous 100 at the Oval, and then episode three uh, features the legendary Sidney Barnes. Uh, some consider him to be the greatest bowler of all time. So worth checking those out on my channel. Uh, there's a Twitter profile for the series at GFF Pod. Uh, and I'll also make some notes in support of this on the blog, which is available at uh, godsandflannelfools.blogspot.com. So, so far then, uh, I've covered pre-war cricket predominantly, uh, the development of the game, uh, its characters prior to the, the Great War. Um, of course, top-level sport went on um, in the background, but es essentially um, at the absolute level and, and real competitive sport, it was on hiatus during this um, really awful period. And many men were, were kind of drafted into the armed forces. Some didn't return. Uh, even those who survived or avoided the action, um, they had to contend with the fact that their best days were behind them. Um, and that meant that many of the stars of the golden age failed to emerge at the top level once, uh, once sport resumed sort of 1919 onwards. Um, so it really took its toll and, and was a bit of a hard stop in the, in the development of uh, not just the game of cricket, but of course, uh, a lot of sport in, in general. Um, the first test matches to be scheduled after the end of World War I were Ashes matches in Australia in 1920 to 21. Um, England crushingly lost 5-0 to Australia. Um, we've heard that before, unfortunately. Um, and indeed, they also lost the next two series. Um, and it was really a period of, of rebuilding the team. Um, but as they hit the midpoint of, of, the, uh, of the decade, the mid-20s, um, a number of talented young players began to emerge um, in the side. You know, players who would become household names. And these included uh, Herbert Suchcliffe, Percy Chapman, who would go on to captain the side, Douglas Jardine, who would also go on to, to captain the side, uh, Wally Hammond, and we'll, we'll talk about him as a star batsman in, in future episodes, Patsy Hendren, Morris Leyland, Morris Tate, uh, Les Ames, the wicketkeeper, uh, and, of course, Harold Larwood, uh, the fast bowler. So it was a team really full of, full of household names. One man, however, who uh, had already established himself in the team during the, the sort of fallow years, having made his debut prior to the war. Um, and he made his debut prior to the war as a fine attacking batsman, but emerged to the side as more of a, uh, well, a very highly effective defensive, uh, well, defensive genius, really. Uh, was a man by the name of John Berry Hobbs, known to most cricket enthusiasts as Jack Hobbs, or by his nickname, The Master. Yeah. 
That is very good. The swing works, the Oracle again. Jack Hobbs was born in 1882 to a poor family, uh, and he developed a love for the game of cricket as a child. Um, it wasn't really until he turned 20 that his batting really began to develop, and he was then given an opportunity to join Surrey County Cricket Club. Um, and there he, he flourished for several seasons, eventually winning an England call-up in 1908. Um, and although he scored a 50 on his England debut, his early performances uh, were a little bit mixed, um, but he did show great uh, aptitude against the South African spin bowlers, um, which is something at the time that few other batsmen were able to do. And then subsequently, during the 1911-1912 Ashes series, he hit 300s. Um, and so that, that was really his early evolution. By the start of the war, he was widely regarded as, as the world's best batsman. Um, Jack Hobbs served in the Royal Flying Corps during World War I, and um, he kept his uh, cricketing ability up in, uh, in the club game, um, and he was therefore ready to continue when cricket resumed. He hadn't been injured uh, or sort of in, incapacitated during the war, um, but he did then fall ill with appendicitis, um, and curiously, by the time he did con he did return, um, his style had completely changed. He was a far more cautious batsman who valued his wicket and basically favoured a safer method of, of playing. Um, and as a result of this, his performances really went to the next level during the 1920s. Um, and despite actually being quite old, he was entering his 40s, um, he played some of his most acclaimed innings during this period. Um, I mean, it included a, a double hundred, a 211 against South Africa uh, in 1924, his highest test score. Uh, a century in the following away Ashes series, it took him um, to being the leading run scorer in test cricket at the time, which is an interesting sort of snapshot in the evolution of sort of stats and records. Um, he passed... Uh, it was a, it was a total of three hundred and sorry three thousand four hundred and twelve, which had previously been set by um, uh, the Aussie batsman Clem Hill in in nineteen twelve. So Hobbs had a, a number of of key attributes as a batsman. Firstly, he was technically gifted with with superb footwork and shot placement, and this really allowed him to play well against both quick and slow bowlers. Um, whereas a number of his contemporaries tended to specialise really against one or the other. That's what they were known for. Um, whilst initially he was regarded, as I say, as an attacking batsman in the, in the earlier part of his career, he grew into a highly accomplished defensive player. Um, you know, he had magnificent concentration. He was capable of playing long innings and, and became regarded as an expert, particularly on difficult surfaces, as we will uh, we'll hear about in due course. So, uh, as an opening batsman, Jack Hobbs established several effective and very famous opening partnerships. Uh, firstly, with Tom Haywood at, at Surrey, um, and then with Wilfred Rhodes um, uh, and, and at England, and of course, Herbert Suchcliffe uh, for, for, for England as well. Um, and his partnership with Suchcliffe remains to this day the most effective for the first wicket in terms of an average partnership in test history. Um, I'll come back on to this partnership in itself uh, in a moment, but let's, uh, let, let's switch and, and have a, a word first on, on his companion. Theatre, magnificent drama. Herbert Suchcliffe was born in 1884 in Yorkshire, one of three sons raised in a strict Christian upbringing, um, and he was introduced to cricket as an eight-year-old, um, initially as a bowler rather than as a batsman. Um, and at the age of 17, he attracted the attention of Yorkshire. Uh, he was invited to several practice sessions, and at the same time was really starring uh, in the Bradford League as a promising batsman um, who'd begun to develop uh, a very effective defensive technique, rather like Hobbs, um, with particular use of his pads by all accounts, as well as his bat. Um, this was done to counter the swinging ball, which was something that was, um, obviously the swinging ball has been 
um, predominant in English conditions for for all of uh, uh, cricketing history, really. But but his method at the time was was quite revolutionary. Um, during the the war, he was uh, the war. He was called up by the Sherwood Foresters in 1915, um, but he didn't see any active service. He survived the war and was uh, demobbed in 1919, taking a job in a Yorkshire colliery, and uh, finally made his belated first class debut for Yorkshire that year. Uh, he made a 50 on debut for the second team, and then went straight into the first eleven. Uh, initially, that was as a middle order player. Um, and then he replaced Wilfred Rhodes, who of course opened for, for England. Rhodes, for his county, uh, then dropped down to, to the middle order. Um, and a lot of people were following Suchcliffe at this time, you know, as well as his techniques, which, which seemed to be very, um, uh, you know, he stood out, as I say, with unusual, um, very effective techniques. He, you know, he was a striking individual. He had a very carefree uh, expression. He had shiny black hair parted in the middle like a raven. Um, and you can see that in, in photos that, uh, that you, you'll get online. Um, in July of his first season, he scored his first 100. Um, then, you know, continued to go from strength to strength in good form, being awarded as a county cap. And he would go on to be named as Wisdom Cricketer of the Year for that season. Um, as I say, he was a very calm batsman. He believed in his role at the top of the order um, as someone to stabilise and anchor the innings. Um, but at the same time, you know, he genuinely believed the game was there to be won and he would do his best to achieve this. So it was an interesting mix of philosophies. Um, the next couple of seasons for, for Suchcliffe uh, following his debut were a bit quieter, fewer scores. But in 1922, as Yorkshire regained the championship, he ended up with an average of 46. And contributed to, to a run, actually, of three consecutive back-to-back uh, -back championship wins, all of which featured strong performances from him at the top of the order. And that brought him to the forefront of the selectors, who finally gave him his test debut for England in 1924 against South Africa. And that was really the beginning of his very famous partnership with Jack Hobbs. The start to their partnership really couldn't have been better. Um, so they put on 136 for the first wicket at Edgbaston, followed by 268 at Lords, uh, in which Suchcliffe made his maiden test century. Uh, and Hobbs, as I mentioned earlier, made a, a double turn, his highest score. Um, Suchcliffe finished the series with an average of 75, and um, the partnership was really sealed. Um, I should point out, up to this point, the, the Hobbs and Rhodes partnership had already averaged over 61 for the first wicket. So England had already got a, a fantastic platform at the top of the order. It wasn't as if you know, they were really searching for, for something. But um, uh, this was taken to just a new, still unsurpassed level. Um, an average of 87.81 with 15 century stands across 38 innings. So an average of one every two and a half innings. <laughs> um, over the course of, of the next four years, I mean, their partnership really flourished um, as they did as uh, individuals as well. I mean, they contributed strongly to both Surrey and Yorkshire um, before laying a very strong platform down at the top of the order in what, as I say, was to be a very successful decade for the English cricket team with a very strong um, set of individuals um, having won the Ashes back with a as I say, very well balanced side full of full of household names. That is very good. The swing works, the Oracle again. Now we're going to move forward to the Ashes tour in 1928-29, in which England departed to Australia with a very strong team. Now, obviously, Jack Hobbs was older than Suchcliffe and had enjoyed the first part of his international career prior to the war. Um, there were a couple of tours during the 20s in which his participation was questioned, um, but in, he always inevitably would keep going, uh, having managed to avoid the sort of millstone of captaincy, uh, which almost certainly prolonged his career. Um, this tour, however, would be his last. Um, and though his form was nowhere near what it had been from a consistency uh, perspective in previous series, he started the warm-up games very, very well and was a key part of the team. 
Um, now, England won the first test, thrashing Australia by a massive 675 runs at Brisbane. I mean, think of an England win at that ground now, uh, just in itself, let alone that sort of winning margin. Um, and then they followed that up with uh, an eight-wicket win in the second test at Sydney. The third test was played at Melbourne and was a far closer affair. And to take us back to the action, I've got another clip from the late, great Ben Travers, who happened to be in Australia to watch much of this famous series. You've made a lot of tours of Australia, haven't you? you haven't uh, yes, I've been there several times. Uh, I, I, I was there very luckily in 1928, 29, when Bradman first, I saw Bradman play his first innings in this. At Brisbane? Uh, uh, yes. And uh, against England, English bowling, that is. And, oh, uh, it was a, a great tour. It had, of course, a wonderful side. England had probably one of the best they'd ever. Percy Chapman was, was there. And Jardine taking, making his first tour. Farmer White. They were the three amateurs. The days of amateur and professionals, of course. And Jack Hobbs, Sutcliffe who made the, the greatest... I always say, Brian, that the, I think the greatest innings I ever saw in cricket, the test match, anyhow, was an innings played by Jack Hobbs at Melbourne at the last days of 1928 in the test match, the third test match at Melbourne. And Jack Hobbs made 49. And I think that 49 was the greatest innings I ever seen. It had a terrific, of course, the wickets weren't covered in those days, uh, the mercy of the elements. And uh, it had a tremendous thunderstorm the night before. And uh, 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 the sun, the Melbourne, the Australian sun came out the next morning and fairly baked the wicket. And uh, Australians still had two or three weeks to lose. Palmer White polished them off in a couple of overs. And Jack Hobbs said, said I'm afraid we shall, this was lunch, the, 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 the start was late. And Jack Hobbs said, I'm afraid we'll all be out by tea time. <laughs> and at the end, at tea time, he and Sutcliffe were still there. And that was the worst, that must have been the most, the worst batting wicket anybody could ever conceive. I went and saw it at the end of the play. Uh, it, was, it was like concrete with great lumps and holes in it. It, it, it was out of the town. What about the best batsman? Have you ever worked out who you think the best batsman you've ever seen, the best bowler? And there so are on? two kinds of batsmen, aren't there, Brian? Surely. There's the batsman who says, I'm going to slaughter you, and the batsman who says, you can't get me out. The greatest batsman I think the greatest slaughterer I ever saw was undoubtedly Don Bradman. The greatest you can't get me out of was Jack Hobbs. And of course there were others like that. It's the approach to the game, not merely the execution, but the mental approach to the game. Uh, Amazing personal performance. Um, uh, which uh, Travers describes there. I mean, considered one of the great defensing I defensive innings in the context of a match. I mean, both players actually um, uh, were hit on the body repeatedly, but showed tremendous technique and mental resolve. Um, and Wisden actually recorded it as one of the worst wickets in, in history. Um, so England won that match by three wickets, thanks largely to the brilliant batting of their opening pair. Uh, Suchcliffe actually went on to, to score 100 um, in that match. And then the fourth, another close match in, in Adelaide. Uh, they won by 12 runs before Australia scored a, a consolation victory in the fifth test, uh, also played at Melbourne, uh, in which uh, Hobbs scored 142 on the first day's play to record his final test century at the age of 46 years old, which still makes him the oldest test centurion to this day. Um, it's uh, obviously, uh, you'll notice there, uh, two test matches played at Melbourne. So this is before they uh, extended to uh, to Perth and obviously some of even the smaller grounds uh, weren't hosting international cricket in those days. Um, it's also worth noting that, that whilst this was regarded as a relatively quiet series for, for Jack Hobbs personally, 
I mean, he still finished with 451 451 runs at over 50. Um, Suchcliffe also uh, shone with uh, 355 runs and and two centuries. So, um, yeah, a very, very strong uh, performance at the top of the order. Of course, um, the out-and-out star of that series was a certain Wally Hammond who hit uh, an amazing 905 runs at an average of 113. But fear not, we will uh, take a closer look at his England contributions in a a later episode. Uh, Jack Hobbs would would return to England to play his final test matches in the 1930 Ashes series um, before announcing his retirement. He received a standing ovation from the crowd in in that series and and three cheers from the Aussie team. Um, But unfortunately, this came as part of a series loss to the tourists who were were boosted by a certain Don Bradman in their ranks, making his first tour. Um, Hobbs saw out the remainder of the season uh, with with good contributions for Surrey and went on to play for them for a few more seasons, actually, eventually retiring uh, at the county level in 1935 at the grand old age of 53, if you you can believe that. Um, Suchcliffe, however, uh, he continued with England through to the mid-30s, eventually... um, well, actually, injury eventually caught up with, with such cliff, and his first-class career effectively ended with the outbreak of the Second World War in 1939. Um, he would continue to be involved in cricket, mentoring a, a number of the Yorkshire stars in, in the 40s and 50s, including the great Len Hutton. Um, and he would continue to follow the county all the way to, uh, to his death in, in 1977. So... Um, I mean, if we take a final look at, at their test match stats, um, this famous partnership, Jack Hobbs, 5,410 runs at an average of 56.94, so nearly 57 in 61 tests with 1,500s, and such cliff, 4,555 runs at an average of 60.73, so nearly 61, uh, which is one of the most uh, impressive averages of, of all time still. Um, that was achieved in 54 tests with uh, with 1,600s. Um, collectively, their partnership averaged 87.81 with 15 century stands. It's still regarded as the, the finest opening partnership in test cricket. I mean, it surpasses Greenwich and Haynes and uh, Langer and Hayden. When you, when you take into account the number of times they played together... Um, and, you know, if you think about the current woes at the English team of the top of the order, um, you know, trying to find, uh, you know, a couple of... Well, for, for a while it was to, to find a, a partner for Cook and now it's to find a couple of opening batsmen and a number three. I mean, what would they give for that sort of stability right now? So, as I mentioned, England lost the Ashes at home in, in 1930 and... This coupled with a few retirements and the emergence of the young Don Bradman um, was, a, was a real worry for, for a lot of supporters. The Ashes by this stage had gathered real significance and momentum as a concept. Um, I mean, the urn was really established itself. Its history was there. Each series had taken more and more prominence than, than the last. Uh, and it really captured the passion of the nation and, and the leading players of the time. The shift, I think, from this being a sort of enjoyable, frivolous pursuit to something more important will form the um, the basis and the subject for the next episode of Gods and Flannel Fools, in which we track the most controversial Ashes tour in history, when a certain Douglas Jardine set about making it his sole mission to recapture the urn at any cost. Until then... Thanks for listening to Gods and Flannel Fools.